Hello everybody, welcome to Natural Experiments, an empowering tool for social data science webinar by Sage Campus. Let me start by introducing myself. I'm Amy Sparrow, your moderator for today. I'm a senior marketing manager for Sage Ocean and Sage Publishing. Your speaker today is Dr. Taha Yazari. So Taha is a senior research fellow in computational social science at the Oxford Internet Institute. He's an Alan Turing fellow at the Alan Turing Institute for Data Science and a research fellow in the humanities and social sciences at, at Wolfson College at the University of Oxford. He will also soon be joining University College Dublin as an associate professor in sociology. Taha is our course instructor um, and course author for Sage Campus's research design and social data science course. And listeners today of this webinar will be getting a 25% discount on that course. Next slide, please. So before I hand over to Taha, I'm just going to say you can send in your questions, engage with us for this webinar, um, either on Twitter using the hashtag Sage Talks or in the question box that you can see on the screen. So without further ado, I'm going to mute myself and hand, hand you over to Taha, who will talk to you today and conduct this webinar. Well, thank you very much, Amy. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for the nice introduction. I'm very excited and happy to have this opportunity to talk to you uh, through some of my own research and also try to give a kind of overall introduction to natural experiments and how they can be used um, in social data science. Um, let's uh, start with the very last word of the title of this talk, uh, the word science. Um, you know, I was wondering, preparing for this uh, lecture, uh, what exactly science is and um, as most of us do these days, to find the answer to any question, we go to Google. Uh, but also I'm lazy, uh, particularly when it comes to reading, so I just search images that Google can find for me when the query is science. I know it's not a quite uh, um, uh, academic way of research, but um, you know, just to give an idea of what is science that we all talk about all the time. Uh, well, this is what I got. Um, if you Google science and uh, search for images, these are the top images that at least Google brings up for me. And um, having looked at this and trying to summarize them, basically, apparently, science is um, these two objects, you know, an Erlenmeyer and a very misleading um, picture of an atom, which, as an ex-physicist, I know how uh, unrealistic this image is. Anyway, so, um, but on a more serious note, uh, what we mean by science is not really the objects that we study or the objects that we do our studies with. It is about the methods. Uh, what distinguishes science from any other uh, collective human activity? It distinguishes from journalism, from art, from culture. The um, I bring up the definition of scientific methods here from Oxford Dictionary a method of procedure that has characterized natural sciences since the 17th century, consisting in systematic observation, measurement, and experiment, and the formulation testing and modification of hypotheses. Um, I highlighted some of these keywords here, particularly uh, observation, measurement, experiment, and hypothesis or theory. Um, this is a very accurate definition, I must say. Uh, particularly, I like the emphasis on the young, the newness of this method. It only emerged around 17th century, which is rather recent when you think about uh, the history of humankind uh, and uh, the history of other sorts of human activities, particularly art and culture. Uh, so science is a new thing, and that's why sometimes we are still struggling to understand how it works. Uh, but let's get into that and try today a bit further. Uh, so let me show this diagram here, which uh, connects these four steps that scientific methods um, are consisting of. It starts always with observation. We see something and we think, oh, that's interesting. Uh, we want to understand that. We want to be able to uh, uh, explain that and potentially we want to control it. We want to make use of it. We want to take advantage of that natural or uh, otherwise uh, social uh, phenomenon or observation. So in order to be able to explain our observation, we always build a theory. The word theory uh, 
is used and misused and overused all the time. Um, but what here I simply mean my theory is uh, some sort of explanation, some sort of logical explanation for our observation. Uh, obviously, there could be many, many different theories trying to explain and trying to uh, describe the same observation. Uh, and we need to find a way to distinguish between these theories. Um, what happens in sciences and in scientific methods is that to be able to distinguish between theories, uh, we try to create predictions based on each theory of the observation should also come up with some predictions. Otherwise, it's not testable and therefore it's useless. So when we go to a pub and after a few drinks, uh, one of us comes up with something rather silly and say, oh, listen, I have a theory, this and that. Often when you think about it, you cannot reject that theory because it doesn't come up with a prediction and it doesn't, doesn't come up with a way of testing the theory. So when we say theory in methods, in scientific methods, it has to be uh, testable and that usually happens through predictions which we can then test through experiments. So no, let me go back again. We observe something, we come up with an explanation. That explanation provides a prediction, and then we test that prediction in an experiment. Then you must say, that's the end of the story. Why do we have an arrow here? And why this cycle actually continues? Well, the reason is that often in any experiments, we find a little bit of, even if the theory is quite accurate, but we always find uh, new observations, new measurements that cannot be uh, explained by the first theory that we had or the first generation of theories. So these new observations then lead to new generations of theories and the cycle continues. And that's why when you look at uh, more established disciplines or older disciplines like physics, you see that there are generations of theories coming one after the other. Uh, starting with Newton and then uh, the gravity and then we, we had uh, quantum physics and then quantum mechanics and then we had relativity and then quantum relativity and so on. And each time the theory becomes a bit more successful in uh, making predictions and being tested more accurately uh, through new experiments. Sometimes you have to wait 100 years or um, a long time to be able to have the technology to test that theory that you had. Sometimes you start with observations and many, many observations might uh, be needed, 100 years of observations for you to be able to come up with a theory that explains all those observations. So, in different disciplines, these four elements uh, play around differently. Uh, in some disciplines, people become specialists in experiments, for example, experimental physicists or experimental psychology. In some disciplines, people become more focused on theory. But uh, the bottom line here is that these four elements should work together. Um, so, it might sound like a bit of a long introduction, but I thought it's good to make sure that we are all on the same page with the definitions. Um, now let's focus on experimentation, uh, which is the main topic of this webinar. Um, experimentation uh, is also rather new in our culture. Um, basically, it was only uh, around 9th and 10th centuries that uh, scientists started to use experimentation, which later, about 600 years later, led to the formation of scientific Method. So this, this paradigm change took almost about six, seven centuries itself. Rather slow, but quite successful. Before that, uh, we had very little to say about how the world functions beyond religion and beyond uh, spiritual beliefs. Uh, science in the modern terminology and in the modern sense uh, only started to uh, appear when we started with experimentations and started with quantification and to uh, test and distinguish between different theories. Uh, funny enough, uh, uh, when uh, some scientists started to use experimentation in the work uh, in mostly in the Middle East, uh, elsewhere in medieval Europe, for example, it was looked at um, 
rather suspiciously and people did not believe that you actually need to do experiments because uh, as long as your explanation uh, matches and fits with religious beliefs then it should be correct uh, which we know that is not exactly how things done in science today um, when we talk about experimentation um, well there are different type of experimentations and different approaches to experiments um, the general um, typology usually starts with uh, randomized controlled trials that are very common in uh, medical studies um, then we have quasi experiments part of them are natural experiments that is the focus of us today and um, some people also put observational studies under the general uh, umbrella term of experimentation some people say observational studies are not really experimentation uh, it's more of an observation trial, uh, observation approach, but uh, we're going to talk about that also today. Um, you might ask why um, the focus in social data science is on uh, quasi-experiments, natural experiments, and observational studies, and not randomized control trials. Uh, well, uh, it could be another webinar to, to answer this question, but uh, very briefly, the reason is that the well, RCTs or randomized controlled trials are difficult and expensive and often they come with high risk. Even in medical studies, you come up with new drug, uh, you want to test it, you need to create different groups and apply or provide the drug uh, or the treatment to them. Uh, it might work, it may not, but there could be side effects. Uh, you need volunteers to uh, take your treatments, you need a very accurate and precise monitoring of uh, the process, all these make RCTs rather expensive uh, and difficult to, to run. Nevertheless, they are very powerful in showing causalities and uh, quantifying the effect of different treatments. Uh, whereas uh, in social data science, uh, because we are fascinated with all the opportunities that are out there, all the digital data that we are generating today on digital platforms, uh, those data often could be analyzed and could be used in other settings and other designs, such as uh, natural experiments. That is why we are focusing on them today and more generally in social data science. Um, I have a few slides and I'm going to take about five minutes to talk about theoretical foundations of experimentation. Um, to be honest with you, this is a little bit boring, but if you stay with me five minutes, uh, after that I'm going to show you slightly more exciting examples. But let's get the foundations uh, set at the beginning. Um, so, in a most simple, uh, simplest setting, imagine we have uh, two different conditions. Uh, the control condition, which is the natural, usual, normal condition, and treatment condition where we apply some sort of treatments or we change the conditions slightly uh, something is different to the normal so we have these two different conditions and we assume that the outcome of the system that we are studying or it could be a behavior of a person or it could be um, the reaction to different conditions coming from someone's body and someone's um, i don't know the, uh, different organisms, um, the outcome we assume could be Y not and Y1 here. And these two variables uh, can be theoretically different. And the difference between these two is actually what we are interested in and what we call the treatment effect or the causal effect. So uh, delta here is the difference between the outcome of uh, our measurement on the normal condition why not, uh, subtracted from the outcome of our measurement on the treatment condition, the difference between these two is what we call causal effect. If delta or this difference is zero, well, the treatment, the assumption that they had is not true. There is no difference between these two conditions. And if there is a non-zero causal effect, then we can say, well, our treatment leads to this outcome. Uh, it causes this particular outcome. Um, the thing is that uh, 
often we need to, not often, always we need to apply this treatment to multiple systems or to multiple subjects. So if you are working with humans to multiple individuals. Uh, and what we do then is to average the effect that the treatment has on the, all the members of our groups. So instead of two, putting two people into two conditions, we create two groups of people and put one group in certain condition and we keep the other group as the control group. And then we look at the average of the outcomes and the average of delta uh, between the two groups, the difference, uh, the average of the difference is the uh, group causal effect. Why do we need to do, the, to do this? Uh, well, it is simply because if we only compare two individuals, even though we might be able to see some difference between the outcomes, but this could be due to many different factors. Uh, there are basically, it's very difficult to find two individuals who are exactly the same in any sense, but the treatment that we apply to only one of them, um, therefore, whatever we observe could be because of all the other differences that these two individuals could have. Let me give you a classic example. Uh, going to the college leads to higher income when you are uh, in your 30s. This sounds like a plausible uh, causal effect. Uh, we want to test that. We pick up two people, send one of them to college and keep the other one out of the college. It's a thought experiment. Uh, we can do that for other reasons. But even if we do that, and then we later see that, oh, the person that we did send to the college has a higher income when they are in their 30s, it is very hard to say that it was only because that person went to the college. It could be because that person is smarter, that person has better connections, that person is, I don't know, more hardworking. Uh, it could be for many different reasons. What we do uh, by having groups of people into two different conditions in our thought experiment, a bunch of people sent to the college and a bunch of people kept out of the college for control, uh, is that we assume that all those random effects cancel each other out within the group. So if you want to write it down, uh, the average of outcome uh, in the treatment group minus the average of outcome in the control group is the effect, the delta, the, the causal effect we are interested in, uh, plus the differences between all those random features that are coming from the differences between different individuals. But we assume that they cancel each other out because the assignment of subjects or individuals to the control and treatment groups are random. Hence the word random in our CTs. Uh, when we are building the groups of two people, um, we do not send all the boys to the group who are going to the college and all the girls to the group who are not going to the college because then that brings in uh, other factors that might uh, stop us from being able to measure or to isolate the effect coming only from the college. Um, that's why randomization is very important in uh, experiments. Uh, well, that sounds all good, but it's not as easy as it sounds. Um, there could be lots of things not working. For example, uh, the main problem in uh, RCTs is uh, con contamination, and that is when we think that we are applying the treatment only to one group, but somehow our treatment spill overs to uh, spills over to the uh, control group too. It's our, if imagine our treatment is some news, some information. Uh, we have 20 people in a class, we pick up 10 of them, we tell them something and we keep the others uh, uninformed. But there is a good chance that one of these 10 people that have the information pass it to the members of the other group. Uh, I'm sorry if you hear a helicopter or uh, there was the ice cream van a few seconds ago. Uh, but I thought it's it's not a bad idea to sit outside. Anyway, uh, what I was saying is that uh, we cannot always be sure that the treatment uh, is confined to one group and it does not affect the control group, particularly when it comes to social science experiments. Uh, 
uh, it's much more difficult to, to, to isolate the two groups compared to, let's say, medical experiments when we can be sure that uh, the pill is only given to these individuals and the other people do not receive the same pill. Uh, because social experiments uh, deal with social behavior and social behavior are more difficult to control. Um, the other thing that we assume when we are uh, dealing with experiments and designing experiments is called stable unit treatment value assumption. It's a bit of a mouthful, but it's nothing uh, more than assuming that the potential outcome um, of one subject does not depend on um, the other people who are assigned to the treatment group. So the effect that the particular treatment has is independent from the effect on other people and how others are assigned to treatment. Again, this assumption could be sometimes challenged when we are doing social science experiments. I hope to clarify this further when I show you examples. Um, finally, uh, we discussed why randomization is important, but uh, one thing to keep in mind is that we, oft, we always are working with a small or finest number of people in each group. Uh, no matter how hard we try to randomly assign individuals into different groups, uh, because we often always we often observe one realization. We run the experiment. If we run the experiment once, this randomization cannot be perfect. Okay, I have 20 people. I mix them in terms of gender, in terms of race, and then I split them into two groups. But then I might end up with uh, one group having a slightly higher, uh, I don't know, height average of height compared to the other group that I have not controlled for, or I end up with two groups that are exactly the same on average or on distribution level, but then one factor is not completely balanced between the two groups uh, that I overlooked, or I could not balance it between the two groups. So that's why we often need to repeat the experiments many, many times and hope that the uh, a uh, causal effect that we measure after many repetitions is exactly what we meant to measure, and it's exactly because of our treatment. Um, let me also say a few things um, uh, about uh, asymmetry and outliers. Uh, we talk, when we talk about average, and I have been talking about average treatment uh, effect or average causal effects for the last 10, five, 10 minutes, uh, we should be careful that the concept of average or mean uh, can be challenged with um, by by asymmetry in our observations or outliers. Um, I can show you some examples here. First of all, I have this hilarious tweet uh, from uh, Nicholas Christakis, who is a, a very distinguished uh, professor at Yale. Um, it's rather old, it's from 2017, when there was the, the conversation, um, the discussion in the US about the tax reform. Um, Sarah Sanders tweeted that the average American family would get a 4,000 raise on the, the president's tax cut plan. Could any member of Congress be against it? Which to me sounds like a good uh, argument if everyone's gonna be Taha, let me pause you for one second there. You've frozen. Um, if, if they get any cuts, it's much smaller. Well, uh, the reply coming from Nicholas Christakis uh, uh, is, uh, is funny um, when he says, uh, if Bill Gates walks into a bar with 89 people, the average bar customer becomes a billionaire, which is mathematically correct uh, because Bill Gates has a lot of money and the average person in the bar has a lot of money therefore, but it doesn't mean that actually every person is rich uh, because Bill Gates here is an outlier. He is far more beyond the distribution of incomes or wealth among the other 89 people in the bar. More scientifically, if you want to look at this, 
uh, I'm taking, I have taken some uh, images from this very good paper. Uh, imagine uh, this diagram shows the average of, uh, outcome of our treatments um, in the control group shown in black and in the treatment group shown in white. Uh, when you look at this, um, it doesn't matter what we are measuring here, just uh, you know, in an abstract way, uh, we see, well, there seems to be a difference between the treatment group uh, and the control group. So uh, whatever was our treatment has some uh, measurable and significant effects. But if we look at the effect on individuals in each of these two groups, we might uh, end up with many different scenarios. The, the best scenario and what we usually assume is uh, case B when um, the populations are symmetrically distributed and there seems to be that, generally speaking, our measurements has higher or larger values in the treatment group compared to the control group. But then uh, it could be because just one outlier in the treatment group showing a, a very large value for some reason and the rest are more or less the same as the control group. It could be because uh, some people in the treatment group responded to the treatment, but interestingly enough, even in the control group, we see that there are two subpopulations for some reason. And it could be because we have different um, number of subjects or individuals in the control and treatment group, and somehow the average is higher in the treatment group but uh, if we had more people here, maybe, or more observations, we might have ended up with the same average as the control group. So it's always important, uh, even though we measure the average, and this is how we report the effect of our treatment, uh, it's important to look behind and to look uh, into the data on individuals and see if the assumptions that we made uh, are actually still correct. Um, you have heard about the statistical tests. Uh, funny enough, uh, if you run the t-test, which some of you might be familiar with, uh, in these two cases, almost everywhere, no matter which of the scenarios are uh, the case, we always get a statistically significant difference. So uh, actually, t-tests or most of the standard uh, significance tests do not solve the problem here uh, if we do not look into the underlying distribution. All right, um, a couple of things. Um, uh, again, two terms that are relevant here, internal validity. Uh, internal validity is more is relevant uh, when we want to make sure that what we measure is exactly what we meant to measure. Um, in social sciences, again, particularly, it becomes more important because a few uh, uh, concepts here. For example, maturation. Uh, human behavior changes in time. If we are running an experiment, for example, on um, online behavior, we know that, generally speaking, online behavior uh, is a dynamic concept. You know, The number of people who are using the internet, the number of people who are on different platforms, and even the behavior of the same person on a given platform change all the time. And if we are running an experiment here, we should be careful that these changes that happen anyway and naturally would not be uh, mixed with the changes that we want to measure in our experiment. Again, working with humans, uh, the, the test, the experiment itself can change uh, the behavior of individuals in the experiment, uh, which is interesting, but is not exactly what we wanted to measure initially. Uh, and finally, uh, when it comes to measurements, and I have been using the word measurements rather liberally so far, but uh, it is very complicated to measure human behavior. Think about concepts like love, uh, passion, uh, opinion. Uh, these are things that we use quite frequently when we talk about human behavior, but when we want to measure them, we always have to use an instrument we always have to measure something else and use it as a proxy for those concepts. For example, to measure, I don't know, social uh, distance or social similarity between two people, we can use the number of times they have uh, uh, called each other on the phone or the number of messages they send to each other on Facebook. This is a proxy for that concept. 
uh, and the instrument here is Facebook messaging or phone calls. Uh, sometimes it is very difficult to find the right proxy for the same concept or for the same value variable, and that is a threat to internal validity of our experiments. The other concept is external validity, uh, and it is even more related to natural experiments uh, because um, uh, we will see, because we often use a certain platform and a certain population to run our experiment. And the big question here is whether we can then easily generalize that uh, result to other populations or other platforms. What's, uh, how much of our observation or our measurement is due to the specificities of our uh, design of our experiment and the way that we have uh, run the experiment. Uh, and if we cannot answer that question easily, then probably we cannot be so sure about the external validity of our uh, results. All right, uh, one more minute and then uh, we get to the more tangible and uh, easier to grasp part. Sorry, it took me a bit longer than what I thought. Uh, quasi experiments. I had to talk about um, RCTs because then only then I can talk about quasi experiments, which is the focus of us uh, in social data science. Well, in quasi experimental designs, the researcher has almost uh, or no control uh, very little or almost no control uh, over the assignment to conditions and does not manipulate the causal variable of interest. Uh, Quasi-experiments happen when somehow there are two groups and there are different conditions applied to the two different groups, but the researcher is not the person who decides who is in which group. It is a little bit like the college, the actual college experiment. Um, well, earlier I said, oh, imagine we sent 10 people to college and keep 10 people out of college. Well, we can't do that because it's the individual's choice and uh, uh, capabilities and the affordance that they have to go or not to go to the college. We do not decide who goes to the college. Well, but we still can then compare the income of people who've been to the college and not in the college and try to infer some causality from going to the college uh, on your income. As you can see, it is a little bit weaker than what we were hoping for because we wanted to send people into the college group and no college group completely randomly and independent from all the other factors. But in reality, we cannot do that. We don't have, uh, we don't want to do that. It's not even ethical. Uh, but what we can do is to go and still study people who decided themselves to be assigned to each of these two groups and try to understand the, the role of college in your uh, future income. Uh, the example I'm going to show you here is actually uh, uh, one of my own works with uh, Yanni Rahab, uh, my former student here in Oxford. Um, and I thought it's a good example of how quasi-experiments could be used uh, in a more kind of modern setting. Uh, this experiment was conducted in collaboration with an online game, and the online game is called Play the Future. Uh, uh, it's a very uh, entertaining game. Uh, it asks you random questions. Um, uh, questions about the future, questions that you have no way to knowing to know the answer of, um, but you still can make a guess, and you're supposed to make that guess. For example, here the question was, say, cheese, how many people will be in the official royal wedding photo of Prince Harry and Meghan? Well, this is a little bit old when everyone was excited about the wedding and them, um, and then you make a Yes, and then you record your guess, and when the wedding happens, and then the picture, the photo is taken, we know the answer. You get points depending on how close your guess was to the actual reality. Um, everyone gets a hint uh, playing the, the game. Uh, here, the hint is the number of people in the uh, royal wedding photo of uh, some other royal couple. And then people also have the option of using a second hint. Uh, the second hint is not visible to everyone, 
uh, to see it, you have to use a key and you have only uh, three keys, I think, uh, every 24 hours. So you have limited number of options, uh, lim limited number of uh, keys to open the second hint. And then in the second hint, there will be more information. In this case, uh, the number of people in the formal picture of uh, another UK-based, I guess, uh, royal wedding, which is a slightly more useful information than the first hint. Um, right, uh, to run an experiment here, and our experiment was about anchoring. Um, anchoring is when uh, some marginal information affects our judgment of a situation, particularly when it comes to numerical judgments. For example, you want to buy a car, uh, you talk to the dealership and they tell you uh, the price is 100, whereas the actual price is 50, uh, and you know that 100 is not a good price, you start to negotiate, uh, but because you started from 100, uh, even if you're a very good negotiator, you might end up with, I don't know, 80, whereas the actual price was 50. When, uh, whereas if the initial price was, I don't know, 70, you might have ended up with 60. So somehow that initiation, the original number might affect your final uh, judgment or the final number that you uh, agree on. In the less direct way, it is even more interesting. There have been experiments showing that uh, there were judges or uh, people who were being trained to become judge and uh, were given um, made up scenarios and uh, crime, descriptions of crimes and they were asked to uh, give sentences, you know, how many years of jail for this particular crime. And as we are doing this, there was a, a screen on the wall showing random numbers for each case, just a random number appeared on the screen, 10, 15, 2000. Funny enough, uh, in cases and judges who have uh, made the decision while there was a bigger number on the, wall, on the wall, came up with longer sentences for the very same crimes. So even though they were professional, they were doing the best to be fair, and they knew that the number on the wall has nothing to do with the crime or the judgment, nevertheless, because of the psychological effect that seeing a larger number on the wall has on them, those with larger numbers ended up with longer prison times. Uh, that's the other extreme of anchoring effect. Anyway, uh, enough uh, psychology. Uh, what we wanted to do is to test this and to quantify the, the amount of anchoring uh, using this um, app and this game. Uh, the problem though is uh, the first hint is the same for everyone. We cannot put our treatment there. We have to put the treatment in the second hint. But the problem is that we do not choose which uh, player gets to see the second hint. It's them to decide which, uh, if they want to see the second hint or not. Uh, and that's why it's not a, a randomized control trial, uh, because we do not make this assumption. And this is a quasi-experiment where the assignment to the treatment is uh, out of our control. Um, so what we did was the following. Um, uh, for example, uh, for the question of what is the temperature tomorrow at 10 a.m., and 10 a.m. is usually the time of the day that the temperature is uh, between the maximum and minimum temperature of the day. It's between the hottest and coldest time of the day. Um, and the first hint is the temperature yesterday at 10 a.m. That's the same for both groups. For the second hint, uh, for people who decided to see the second hint, uh, to half of them, we gave the highest temperature yesterday. Obviously, it's the highest. It doesn't claim anything about the temperature at 10 a.m., but some more information. And to half of them, we showed the lowest temperature yesterday. So this is the difference between the two treatments that we had that we expect to uh, induce some effects, some differences between the temperature that people guess in the two different groups. We expect people who received the information about the highest temperature yesterday 
make larger guesses for the temperature of tomorrow at 10 a.m. And the other people in the other group, we expect them to come up with a smaller number. Even though, logically, when you think about it, the lowest temperature sh should not, um, I mean, having a small value here should not necessarily mean that tomorrow the temperature at 10 a.m. is smaller. And by the way, both of these facts are completely accurate and they are not contradictory. Nevertheless, we see that people who are exposed to different facts uh, might come up with different judgments and different uh, perceptions. And that is the key to biased media. Uh, when you show facts, not even you don't need to use misinformation or fake news, you do use facts, but by showing some particularly selected facts, you might be able to induce some opinions and some biases in people's uh, judgment. Right, uh, let me show you the, the results of the same question, the, the temperature in Amsterdam at noon on Saturday. Um, and this is the response. Uh, these are the people, these are the predictions coming from people who did not open the second hint at all. Um, these are the, this is the distribution of predictions coming from people who received the higher hint, and these are the people who received the lower hint. And we see that even though theoretically they should predict the same value or at least the same distribution, we see that receiving different information has led to separation between these two groups in the treatment uh, subpopulation. We have run this experiment for many, many different questions in different uh, contexts, and we measured this difference uh, to see that, uh, well, the, the, the difference that you can produce between the two groups, between the predictions of the two groups increases uh, monotonically uh, versus the difference in the hints, the information you provide to the two groups, but then at some point it just starts to saturate and if you give very large or very far anchors the anchoring effect might become rather stable or even at some point it might just start to decrease you know if i sell the car and say instead of 100 or instead of the actual price that is 50 if i say i'm gonna sell you this car for 3000 then the person leaves and thinks that i'm completely crazy so uh, anyway this was the R trial to measure anchoring uh, using a quasi experiment. Finally, let's talk about natural experiments. And um, natural experiments are subsections or uh, a specific uh, category in uh, quasi experiments. In natural experiments, not only we do not have control over who is in which group, we don't even have any control on the treatment. Uh, the treatment happens because of some natural event. Uh, more formally, uh, natural experiments are empirical studies in which individuals are exposed to the experimental and control conditions that are determined by nature or by other factors outside of the control of our uh, ourselves or the investigators. Uh, simply put, something happens out there and it produces some sort of um, uh, different conditions and we think that oh we can compare these two different conditions and learn something about the effect of that external event. Let me give you an example. Uh, in a project we were studying um, petitioning websites in the UK, particularly in the UK petitions are important because um, if you create a petition on the government petitioning website and you manage to get 10,000 signatures from 10,000 different people, and the government has to respond to your petition. Uh, and if you manage to get 100,000 signatures, then uh, the, the, your petition will be discussed in the House of Commons. Uh, not always the response is positive, but at least you get the government and the members of the parliament to, to discuss and to think about whatever you have petitioned for. Uh, we were studying this platform anyway, uh, and we had different research questions, but then, um, and for that, we were collecting the number of signatures uh, to each petition um, every hour. We had uh, some sort of automated crawling system which would collect this data. 
Um, at some point, uh, my colleague Scott Hale, who was doing the collection, um, realized that, well, the code doesn't work um, because the design of the website is changed. Uh, and when we looked up, we realized that there is a new segment on the front page of the website which shows the trending e-petitions. Um, well, the designers of the website thought it's a good idea to promote some of the petitions that are very successful. These are the six petitions that have the highest number of signatures over the past 60 minutes. So these are the hot or the trending petitions. Uh, they thought promoting this might encourage people to sign more petitions and more petitions means more political engagement, more signatures mean more political engagement, better democracy. Uh, we thought, okay, let's test that because things are not usually that straightforward when it comes to humans. Um, what we measured was, first of all, the number of signatures, uh, the overall number of signatures coming to the website uh, before and after the change was introduced. Um, so this is a kind of before-after design, which is yet a subsection of uh, natural experiments. Um, so before the events, before the natural event, and after the natural events. The natural event here is the decision and the implementation of the new design of the website, which we had uh, absolutely nothing to do with. It was something that was decided and done elsewhere. Well, interestingly enough, you see that the overall number of signatures do not change. Um, if anything, they might decrease a little bit, but it's not that significant. So the main aim of the designers, uh, which was to increase the engagement, is not uh, satisfied here. Uh, but then we looked at the Gini coefficient um, of the distribution of signatures between different petitions. Some of you might know what Gini coefficient does. It's a measure of inequality. The higher Gini coefficient uh, in a distribution, that means that uh, there is more inequality. Some units have more, many more than rest of the population. It's usually used to describe income and wealth inequality in different countries. What we see here is that before and after the change, what, ma what changes is the Gini coefficient and the level of inequality. After the introduction of trending petitions, we see that the inequality has increased. That means that fewer petitions receive many, many more signatures. And that is to the expense of the other petitions that now receive fewer signatures. So the overall number doesn't change, but the distribution is now more focused and more concentrated on very few more successful petitions, probably the ones that are already trending. So that's the simple example. Uh, this research was not really groundbreaking, but uh, it's a clean example of uh, a natural experiment um, that is primarily based on uh, one website and one sort of data set. I have a more uh, sophisticated example here, which is another work that I've done with one of my former students, John. Uh, Janowski. Uh, we wanted to study music and how people consume and listen to music. Um, particularly, we were interested in social element of that. Um, the, the music that my friends listen to, how much that changes and influences the music that I listen to. Um, to do this experiment and to be able to answer this question, we had to narrow it down to a very uh, uh, clear cut and isolated experimental design. We thought that the best way is to focus on one sort of events, and those are live events when musicians have concerts. Uh, we collected data from Last.fm. Some of you might remember it was a very popular uh, music streaming app. Um, something like Spotify. And we had data on the friendship network of individuals, uh, the fact that if individuals participated in a live event, went to a concert, and then what music they have listened to. This was a massive data set. Um, I think we had data on 1.3 million uh, users, which is a massive data if you can think about it. 
Uh, for example, this diagram shows the very small subset of users. Uh, the blue ones are the ones who went to the concert uh, by Metallica in Ecuador in 2014. Uh, the red ones are the friends, uh, but they are red because they did not go to the concert. Uh, and we also know what songs they have listened to uh, for the entire time. Um, the, the way that we know that the, these blue ones went to the concert is because uh, they could buy the tickets from the same platform from Last FM. So the records of uh, the purchase, purchase purchases are available. Um, or it was available to us here. The first thing that we observe is that uh, day zero here is the day of the event. And we see that people listen to the same artists that they're going to go to their concert more and more before the event and right after the event. And they even listen more frequently to that artist. And we also separated the artists into two groups, the top artists, the ones that are old, well-known, old not in terms of age, but there are household names. There are well-established groups and bands and artists. Uh, heart artists are the ones that are popular, but the popularity is more recent. They have been recently uh, becoming more popular. Uh, we see that there is no difference between these two groups in terms of uh, the behavior of the listeners. Even in the hyped artist group, people who have gone to the concert uh, listen to the same artist uh, more after the event and that will stay that that stays around for a while and then uh, after about three weeks it goes back to normal well this is very interesting because nowadays you know that uh, artists are paid uh, depending on the number of times that the music is uh, listened to on spotify or different platforms uh, you see that artists can make money not because of the tickets that they have sold uh, to people who came to their events but also through this extra listenership that they might uh, produce uh, by having live events. So far, so good. Nothing much surprising here. But then we looked at the friends of people who did go to the concerts, particularly the friends who did not go. If I'm going, in this case, to Metallica's concert, I listen to them more um, before and after, but what about my friends who did not go to the concert? Would my extra listenership uh, spread to them? Is listenership, music listenership contagious or not? Uh, but when we measure that, the answer is, well, it is. Even people who did not go to the concert listen to the same artist more if they have one friend who has gone to the concert, but that only uh, applies to the top artists. In the case of hype artists, the effect is almost uh, non-existent. That means that no matter that I went to this band's concert today, I listen to them more, but my friends are not bothered. Uh, again, an example here of how uh, a design that is out there, we do not decide who goes to the concert, we do not decide who is friends with whom, uh, everything is out there, yet we can uh, reformulate and reconfigure uh, uh, the data in a way that as if we have done an experiment here. Right, um, I'm um, almost done, uh, just five more minutes. We talked about observations and the experiments, and these two, as I said earlier, are very close to each other, even though we always start with observation, but then and um, sometimes observations and experiments are kind of mixed or they overlap. And, uh, that's where observational studies happen. In observational studies, um, we, uh, we do an empirical investigation of the effects caused by a treatment. However, it does not follow an experimental design. That means that, you know, something is happening out there. We do observe it, we quantify it. Uh, we, we still try to explain it, but it has not much of experimentation in it. That means that there is no control group, uh, and that's the most important feature of an experiment, having a control group to be able to compare to. 
In observational studies, usually one thing happens once and there is no parallel universe that has uh, everything else the same apart from that, uh, that effect or that treatment. Uh, observational studies are very common in astrophysics. Um, you know, we can observe the stars and how they behave and come up with theories and explain them. We can even make predictions, but we cannot experiment with the stars because, well, we cannot. Sometimes the same with humans, because uh, it's difficult to do experimentation with humans, particularly if the treatment is harmful, uh, uh, but we still can do observational studies. Uh, let me give you one example. Um, that is mostly about time. The way that we can use observational studies to infer causality is to utilize or to capitalize on time. Because when we talk about causality, we always use time uh, in a causal chain. If A leads to B, we expect A to happen before B. We do not, we cannot assume that something that happens later uh, have an effect on something that has happened earlier. So we use that to infer causality by doing temporal analysis in observational studies. I talked about petitions earlier. Uh, one thing that we did uh, was to look at social media and particularly Twitter and see if people who create petitions or people who sign petitions or even people who do not sign a particular petition uh, they tweet about it and maybe uh, the question was whether social media and particularly Twitter play an important role in the success of petitions. What we simply measured was the number of, for each petition, the number of times that the petition was signed and the number of times that the link to the petition was mentioned or appeared in a tweet. So for each petition, I have signatures and number of tweets. When you plot these two numbers uh, versus each other, they look like this, which suggests there is a correlation between these two. Petitions who have received more signatures are also the ones who have received more tweets or who have been mentioned in more tweets. But as I'm sure you have heard, uh, correlation is not necessarily causality. We do not know uh, if here, number of tweets that minus the number of signatures or affects the number of signatures or the other way around maybe if a petition is very successful and it has lots of signatures then it is featured in media and then people tweet about it maybe it's the number of signatures that uh, controls the number of tweets from this diagram alone there is no way to determine the, the direction of causality here particularly the direction of potential causality. But what we can do is to take time into consideration. Instead of looking at the number of all the signatures to the petition and all the tweets to the petition, I look at the number of signatures and tweets per day. And instead of comparing the number of tweets and petition for the same day, I can compare the number of tweets today to the number of signatures tomorrow or to the number of signatures yesterday. And I assume that the one that determines the other one should increase first, not after that. You see what I mean? If it's the number of signatures that determines the number of tweets, the fluctuations or the increase and decreases in that should be prior in time to the fluctuations of the number of tweets. We can simply use a uh, uh, time shifted cross correlation. You can look it up. Uh, it's just correlation for two time series that are a bit shifted in time. And what we see here is that uh, actually these correlations are not symmetric. That means that uh, in one direction, there is more correlation. And that is when the number of tweets are more correlated to the number of signatures in the future, which suggests it's the number of tweets that are uh, that is determining the number of uh, signatures. So it's the Twitter that drives the signature and the popularity, not the other way around. Again, you see we had of no control here. We just observe something. We collect the data. We still analyze it. Uh, we analyze it, and we still are able to infer some causality. 
you see my inference is not as strong as the natural experiments or not even, um, and absolutely not as strong as a control trial. Um, but still, we learn something about the role of social media in collective action. Let me quickly summarize. First of all, what makes social data science a science is scientific methods. Uh, experimentation is the core of scientific method. However, it's not always possible to have perfect randomized controlled trials, uh, randomized controlled trials. Uh, that's why we use quasi and natural experiments as a solution to uh, enable us uh, to still infer causalities and still understand uh, human social behavior in social data science. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Taha. Um, I'm now going to use this time to ask some of the questions that have come through today. We don't have too much time left, but we can ask about four. Um, that was a really great webinar. So we had one question here saying, what's the difference when using natural experiments in traditional social science research compared to social data science research? Hmm. Uh, well, in terms of the design and the definitions and the concept, concepts are not many differences or any differences. But uh, natural experiments have become way more popular over the past couple of years, particularly in social data science, because uh, it's more natural to use natural experiments in social data science, where we have extremely useful and powerful tools to analyze the data at a very large scale. But obviously, we cannot have the same uh, size um, of population um, in a control or in a more traditional sort of experimental approaches in more traditional social sciences that are based on mostly based on lab uh, experiments you know in more traditional social sciences you might be able to bring in 100 people at most maybe in one session in the lab um, and that is, then we can do controlled experiments whereas uh, when we do in social data science, we are mostly involved with cases that we have thousands and millions of people in our natural experiments where we uh, we have better tools to analyze the data and we have less uh, power on uh, assigning people or designing the experiment. Um, that that is the difference between natural and more traditional experiments. Um, it's not very common to be honest when you look into literature uh, the concepts of natural experiments has been present in, in more traditional social sciences but it has not been very common and the surge in um, observational studies and natural experiments uh, mostly is due to the digital transformation of our societies in the last few years brilliant um, we have another question here saying that for their social for their social data science studies, we often use um, data from platforms like Twitter, Facebook, and Google. Do you have any good recommendations to deal with the algor algorithm confound that these platforms bring? That's a very good question because uh, one thing that we want to be sure of is uh, not to study the algorithms or the engineers design of the platform i mean we might be interested in that as well but that's different to humans behavior the user's behavior so we want to separate these two you know the specificities that are coming from the design of the platform than uh, natural and general behavior of the users uh, that's why the, re the way to manage this is to have uh, communication with the designers of the platforms, the owners of the platforms, because they know all the details and they can help you to determine uh, if what you observe comes from the particular design of the platform or the algorithms in place or the, the, the observations are due to human behavior. Uh, and it is very much related to the concept of external validity. What you observe and what you measure, what you infer needs to be generalizable to other platforms and more generally to uh, you know, abstract human behavior. You need to talk to the platform owners and designers. In the example I uh, gave you um, when we used the online game, we were in constant uh, conversation with the uh, engineers of the app, not to particularly let them tell us what to do and not to do, but to make sure that 
what we do, uh, what we measure is not coming from the specific features of their design, but it is due to our own treatments and our own design elements. Thank you. Um, a sort of small question here, saying there's always the issue of bias, of value judgments and social sciences. How do we handle that and how much should researchers get involved with their respondents? Hmm. That's a very good question. Um, and related to the previous question, you need to know what you study, you need to know the platform. If it's an online platform, you need to know the population that you study. The difference between social sciences and natural sciences is that we are always part of, in a way, part of the system that we are studying. And the more we know about the system and the more we have experienced the uh, group or system or society that we are studying, the better we can understand our results. However, that's the difference between anthropology and social sciences, um, that you don't want to get involved in your uh, experiments uh, in a way that you are, you are not you, do, you want to avoid being part of your measurement uh, or in any way uh, affect the uh, measurements that you are having uh, if you remember I talked about the testing effect uh, when uh, the system behavior behaviors changes due to the fact that you are testing it uh, you want to avoid that it is important to know the platform, um, but uh, you should always keep distance and also make sure that your personal opinion, your personal judgment does not uh, maneuver or affect your design or your interpretation. Um, over the past few years, I have been involved in many political studies in which we had to uh, study political behavior of uh, people in different countries often we did have uh, rather sometimes strong political opinions ourselves even uh, contradictory ones in the same research team but uh, we kept those to ourselves and we did not let them to interfere with our study and um, at least this is the way of doing that in uh, social sciences brilliant thank you I think I'm going to pause the questions there, so we're a little bit over time, um, but Taha will answer some of the other questions that have come through in a follow-up blog that um, will have the recording of this webinar as well. Um, and thank you very much again, Taha. If you don't mind just going to the last slide, I will let listeners know that um, they get an exclusive 25% discount of Taha's full course of Research Design and Social Data Science. Um, the course is fully self-paced and fully online. Um, you can find out more about it at that link below, um, but just go to campus.sagepub.com and you'll see. Um, the discount code is resdeswebs25. Uh, and just a big thank you again to Taha, and I hope everybody enjoyed this. Thank, thank you very you. much. Bye. You're very welcome. Bye.